This is Pen Dust Radio. Welcome, all you literati, you lovers of words and tales, you who need a break in your hurried, harried lives. We have a salve for your soul with stories imaginative and original. Short stories, riveting fiction, and wildly creative nonfiction. Pen Dust Radio. Definitely not the same old story. Please visit us at pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. We publish literary fiction and creative nonfiction. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. In this short story, Francis Duffy's main character reflects on a boyhood steeped in dogma, patriarchy, and racism. His alcoholic father is often absent, and his admiration is for his lioness of a mother who never missed work and put three kids through parochial schools, before Welfare, Ms. Magazine, and Me Too. A Yank, Francis Duffy lived abroad for decades. His initial journey was required, war, but thereafter he went willingly. He returned to the homeland for college, L.A. and San Francisco, and later grad school, UT Austin, then a fellowship at Hawaii's East-West Center, where Obama's parents met. Then he was gone again. He learned in college that deracination, to lose one's roots, is how science labels the expatriation process. Yet he doesn't see the process as one of subtraction, but rather addition. His roots are intact, enhanced by exposure to cultures unlike that into which he was born. Duffy is also the author of Bar Kafka, the captivating story of Joe Nickerson's adventures after serving in Vietnam, which was featured in Season 1 of the Pin Dust Radio podcast. This is a work of fiction. Unlearn. Written by Francis Duffy. Read by Paul Ulrich. Of course, gender reassignment wasn't available then. Not that I was unhappy with having been born male. Rather, it was the latter half of the nature versus nurture dichotomy that vexed me. My abnormality surfaced early. I had ridden my Schwinn to the home of a grammar school pal. In the street in front of it, we were joined by a new kid whose family recently had moved into a house across from pals on Beelzebub Lane. Mikey Coogan, the new guy, had swarms of Irish freckles on a round face, laughed often, and, although two years younger than me, seemed more carnal. That wasn't a word kids would have used then, if only because our school's implant specialist wouldn't dare mention sex in daily religion class. Adultery, yes, but only as the Seventh Commandment's last word, and they never explained the word's meaning. I can't recall how our chat got to a certain topic, and no physical action happened to make the day indelible, just three grammar school boys standing mid-street, talking. What marked me for life was what Mikey said about females, something like, yeah, we know girls ain't as good as boys. He said it with emphasis and a Cheshire Cat grin, nudging us to agree by grinning with him, my earliest recollection of peer pressure. I did grin, yet owing to my having a no-account father, no brothers, two older sisters, and a stalwart working mom, I'd assumed Mikey meant the exact opposite. That is, most adult males are, for reasons I hadn't yet fathomed, dickheads, liars, boozers, fools, and thoroughly unreliable, like Dad. I'd assumed such was the norm, and that Mikey was ratifying my assumption, albeit via irony by declaring the opposite, which was why he grinned. Until then... I thought normal families were run by moms who got scant help from a spouse 
and no help from clergy, lawyers, police, or in-laws. I hadn't yet realized that, although born to a matriarchy, since first grade, I'd entered patriarchy, a.k.a. society. But of course, kids then didn't use words like matriarchy or patriarchy. The best I could do was wonder, to myself, who died and left guys in charge of everything? School nuns were an exception, yet their gender was open to doubt. Many were robust, had male names, Sister Martin Joseph, Mother St. Jasper, and their orca garb hid all but cropped face and violent hands. For me, school seemed like Stalag 17, a weekly TV drama of that era set in a Nazi camp for Yank POWs. At age seven, I'd assume that, because we'd finished lessons and been filed out of the classroom at 3 p.m., I'd weathered day one of first grade's barrage of yelled threats from camp guards. I straight ahead, no smiling, no laughing. Do not cross legs when sitting. Boys, keep your hands out of your pockets. It's yes, sister, not yes, and definitely not yeah. Keep your hands away from your face and fingers out of your nose. No talking in classrooms, the lavatory, or while being marched. My sin was grinning at a pal as we were being marched single file like penguins along a second floor hallway toward exit stairs. As Mother Captor surged from my right, waist to knees rosary beads jangling like cowboy spurs, her inflamed mug and killer whale garb distracted me from noticing a left arm cocked behind its shoulder. She face whacked me for that unauthorized smile her leg speed intensifying the wax force, swiveling my gourd hard left. It had knocked me out of file, so she yanked me back via my necktie. Welcome to patriarchy, bro, enforced by burly females, no less. An obedient son, I'd never before been hit, but didn't cry and not from courage. I'd primal sensed from Mother Captor's taught body lingo, fists on hips, inches away, glaring down at me, that tears would earn me another whack. Eyes lowered, I stood silent as she admired her handiwork, which tattooed my cherubic mug from earlobe to chin. Using virgin flesh as a blackboard, Mother had highlighted the day's message, Obey or get thumped. Such is how it works in Plato's cave. Captors stun captives via a few public object lessons so they need not waste time thumping Gaul individually. A dozen years later, I'd see the same efficiency on the Marines' recruitment depot, the uber-macho Paris Island. Fish plus dynamite equals belly-up submission. Systemic violence to make minds malleable for dogma implantation. It would take years decades, actually, for me to realize that patriarchy rules all societies. Not so in my nuclear family. Our rented flat was a short walk caddy corner from St. Paul's Grammar School, so when I got home after day one of first grade with my right cheek still glowing, I asked, Mom, are you sure nuns are girls? She'd taken off from her six-day-a-week waitress job to walk me to school, and to be there when I got home. As Dad well knew, Mom's Irish temper was best avoided. Before returning from a week's-long binge, after blowing stay-gone money at bars and horse race tracks, he'd call at the downtown Camden restaurant where she worked to gauge Mom's ire. She hit the roof on seeing my glowing right cheek. Mom immediately took me and my two sisters to the school's admin office and warned Mother Captor that if she ever touched any of us again, she would return and, quote, beat your virgin ass. Dad was a barfly, but Mom was our lioness. I had thought that early teens days with Mikey Coogan was my first taste of patriarchy. But no, come to think of it, I take that back. Describing it made me realize I'd been peer-pressured even earlier. 
if you allow that Dad was my peer in that we're both males. It happened when I was in second grade while readying for school one morning. More dogma implant. Shit, Dad said with malice. I was nine years old, standing bent at the waist near our two-bedroom flat's front window, sorting stuff in my school bag. My two sisters and I will soon cross Craven Avenue to begin our week at St. Paul's. Mom is in the kitchen making breakfast and our brown bag lunches simultaneously. Later, she'll vacuum while doing laundry, then bust to her waitress job in downtown Camden. Dad drives a lunch wagon to construction sites, when not jobless or gone on weeks-long binges. Six feet and lean, he stands before the black-and-white TV that had entered our lives the year before. A news station airs film of a black minister being interviewed. He'd led a Sunday march against a southern city where blacks are denied service at a downtown department store's lunch counter, restrooms, fitting rooms, and drinking fountains. Dad didn't like the sound of M. L. King. School and nigg and he starts spouting five dollar words, he says, in what I recognize as his tavern voice. He, for whom I'm named, saw daily boozing with males as normal, manly behavior, mocking the notion that such would cease with marriage or parenthood. That's when I looked up from my school bag and over at Dad, silhouetted against the morning sun entering a side window. What made the day indelible was the hate in his voice. Hatred that wishes Bull Connor had used live ammo on nonviolent marchers, most in their church clothes, rather than just attack dogs and high-pressure water hoses. Dad sees me look his way, so he adds to the day's lesson. Martin Luther King, he says, his right fist bald and his eyes on me rather than King's TV image. A big n My patriarch instilling requisite hatred. Of course, M. L. King wasn't being scorned for being female, as would Mikey Coogan a few years later. Yet, King and his race were being defined as inferior to the white males who rule patriarchy, as were females of all races. As yet, I didn't know different, nor would I during eight years of grammar school where all classmates and teachers were white that despite the reality that less than a mile from school was a black neighborhood known as Matchtown, because it was said one match would destroy all its shanties, a statement usually ended with a guffaw. Neighborhood grammar schools funneled us to a regional high school where my large freshman class of 312 had only two black people, one of each gender. But I'd already begun to learn otherwise. Four years of Little League baseball with all-white teammates and coaches led to three years of Babe Ruth League ball, where some teams had at least one black player. All were fine athletes, good teammates, and, frankly, I got along better with them than the whites prone to supremacist posturing a la dad. Also, Monsignor Fartney, our parish VIP who advised Mom to tolerate Dad's daily boozing. When Mom sought counseling about Dad's desertions, his nibs decreed, better drunk than gone. Males defending systemic male privilege, a.k.a. patriarchy. My unlearning of implanted dogma accelerated from my freshman year of high school when I got a weekend job, full-time each summer, in the housekeeping department of a Catholic hospital. Many black co-workers plus recent immigrants from Italy, Poland, and Ireland. Only two whites on the hospital softball team, which I enjoyed more than years of whites-only Little League. I thrived amid the mix of people who could laugh at themselves more noticeably than did males of my race and nationality. In daily dogma class, nuns hardly mention marriage, except to inform us that they themselves were wed to Jesus. Some seemed dismissive of lay females wed to mere males and the carnality required to procreate. 
They'd wince as though sniffing Limburger cheese when we wrote recited, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Nor did I learn of carnal matters from TV, which was still divorced from reality, censored, and offered only three channels. So I learned from neighborhood peers. My town's farmer's mart was a very long, prefab one-story building with two aisles on either side of a center section. Visitors strolled past dozens of stalls where vendors sold farm produce, hardware, and housewares. In the middle, between those two aisles, vendors sold eats and cold drinks. As kids, we rode our bikes everywhere, so five miles each way to the mart was an adventure. On a summer day less than a year after Coogan's remark about girls being inferior, I biked along the side of Route 130 to the Farmer's Mart with him and two other boys. As we strolled the aisles, we wanted a cold drink after the hot ride. In the center section at a corner shop, a vendor's counter was mounted with two clear plastic vats circulating lemonade and grape juice. Coogan was two years younger than me, and we're both Catholic. I want to say he was more worldly than me, but in hindsight, I'd say the difference was he was from a normal male-dominant family, where I was the only son and youngest child of a female-dominant family. As we approach the counter to buy cold juice, Mikey scoots ahead to place a hand over the G lettered across the grape juice tank, looks back at us, and grins as he had when he'd said girls are inferior. The two other boys burst out laughing. I grinned knowingly, but in fact, I didn't know. Judging by their leering grins, rape had something to do with sex. So that night, I looked it up in the paperback dictionary Mom kept on her nightstand for when she did crossword puzzles. There was rapeseed of the cabbage family, and we'd been at a farmer's market when he used the word. Still, I knew that wasn't Mikey's gist after I read the next definition. Through a dozen years of daily catechism class, students couldn't ask questions. Only nuns did. Decades later, I can make myself shudder to think how a nun would have detonated had a student raised a hand to ask about rape, divorce, abortion, or homosexuality. Kids were there to obey memorize, and repeat after the implant specialists, the sixth commandment is, thou shalt not kill. After a dozen weeks on Paris Island, then two more at Camp Geiger for infantry training, I was ordered to Camp Pendleton for overseas processing. Rather than go by Greyhound, I opted to hitchhike from New Jersey to California keen to see more of the homeland I was being sent halfway around the globe to defend. Short hair parted left and combed flat with white sidewalls, button-down beige shirt tucked in, thin black necktie, belted dark chinos, shined boots. I hoped my message would prod drivers to ignore good sense and pick up a strapping male hitcher. I held a sign that read, To War Via L.A. USMC. Bold-faced caps spaced wide on thick gray poster board that wouldn't bend in the wind, backed by a flat board long enough to hoist the sign higher than my head. Legible for eyes approaching fast. Days awaiting rides along roads west afforded time aplenty to sift how I'd been schooled for what I was being sent abroad to do. I'd received straight A's through a dozen years of daily catechism class because I found the content interesting. So much so that, misreading interest as piety, my classmates voted me most likely to become a priest. No, I focused because, whereas algebra and geometry seemed cold and bloodless, religion and history were live theater, analyzing people rather than numbers. Yet, memorizing dogma didn't necessarily convince me. Getting face-whacked on day one at Stalag 17 held more sway. So from day two, I deployed a survival M.O. Deadpan expression, eyes and ears open, avoid spotlights, use stealth, and smile inwardly. 
Instinctively, I tried to read the language of behavior from a safe distance, relying on what people said. For example, questions were allowed in science class, taught by nuns, but forbidden in catechism, also taught by nuns. Eventually, it would take decades, I would decide which implanted absolutes are verified and which are a delusion. Once war had extracted me from the platonic cave in which I'd been born, all truths could be questioned. Starting with bedrock misogyny. God the Father and God the Son. Yet, no God the Mother and God the Daughter. Does not Genesis codify patriarchy, chapter 2, verse 7, and gender inequality, chapter 2, verses 18 to 22? Why, after 2,000 years, are women deemed unfit for holy orders? I knew better. Mom never missed work, putting three kids through parochial schools despite a thieving husband and merciless clergy. Before welfare. Before Ms. Magazine. Before Title IX. Before Me Too. But for her... My sisters and I would have been orphaned and separated. Meanwhile, Dad was most at home in dingy bars. Bitter places brought from Ireland for the low end of the working class, where barflies gathered a boast of how they've scammed wives, employers, and other oppressors. He excelled at mocking others, a tavern-learned skill he'd bring home with the stink of beer, ashtrays, and urinals. A World War II draft dodger, he'd boast, only dummies get drafted, and the dumbest of all enlist. Age 20 and off to war, I'd yet to meet a man the equal of mom. This story is copyright 2021 by Francis Duffy. This recording is copyright 2022 by Rivercliff Books and Media. All rights reserved. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pen Dust Radio. For more information or to submit your writing to the podcast, please visit pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. The story featured in this episode is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are the products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events, locales, or persons, living or dead, is entirely coincidental.